Hi folks, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of this speech is to take a closer look at the Challenger speech that Ronald Reagan gave on the uh, evening of the Challenger disaster. And I know we've been looking at this in class a lot and we've taken a look at it from a couple different angles and hopefully this presentation will help you to see some of the other details that you can find in this particular piece of writing. So we're going to take this kind of paragraph by paragraph and kind of chunk by chunk and see what's going on. Now we already talked about kind of the soaps of this. This is that rhetorical situation, um, Aristotle's rhetorical triangle. So we know the situation, we know that uh, the audience, we know what was going on with the occasion, and we know a little bit about the purpose that Reagan had. He had to come out and calm everyone down and soothe the country and make everyone feel good again after this terrible disaster. And so you notice in his opening lines, it shows that something major has happened, that he recognized is that this is not life as usual anymore. He's canceling the State of the Union address in order to come on and speak about this instead. And it kind of also reminds the audience that this is the President of the United States who's speaking. This is the leader who is making this decision and who is going ahead and has the authority to do this. So you get this ethos sort of established right in the very beginning of the speech. Now, if you look at the rest of the first paragraph, look at the word choice. You have all of these really strong emotional words. People are mourning. Mourning implies not just that you're sad or that you're upset, but a long period of detailed and, and in-depth kind of grief. Remembering. Um, all of these imply this idea of something that's long-term and that's serious. Notice he mentions his wife by name. He says, Nancy and I, not the First Lady of the United States or Mrs. Reagan, but she's introduced as Nancy. Like, of course it's Nancy. We know each other. S establishing this kind of credibility. This is this ethos again to establish with your audience. And it makes it sure that he shares the grief. It makes it both personal and national by saying that the President of the United States shares in this loss. Now he starts off the second paragraph by kind of grounding this event in history, reminding us that we've had this successful um, space program, but acknowledges that this is a different kind of tragedy, that it's been a long time since this happened, uh, that it's not unheard of, but that this is a different kind of thing to lose an astronaut in flight. But it does again remind people that this is not the only time that this has happened in our history. Now the rest of paragraph two, he spends some time on these emotion-laden words again courage and heroes. Um, all of these have these kinds of connotations of the sort of nobility and those are very specific choices of words here to give that kind of, um, create the kind of pathos for the audience. He names each one of them, calls them out by name, and then reminds us that we mourn their loss as a nation together. Not I as their president am sad, like I'm sorry for everyone else that's going through this, but makes it a corporate event that is happening. Now when he gets into paragraph three, he does this interesting bit. He says, we cannot understand everything that you understand. And this admitting your weak points is kind of a way to build up your ethos. You say to somebody, look, I'm not perfect, and it makes them kind of trust you a little bit more. So the President of the United States stands up and says, I don't know what the families are going through, but we share this with you. We feel that there's a loss. We're thinking about you. And notice again this, we feel this, we're thinking about you, not I feel your loss or I'm sorry for you. So he's looking here to make all of these connections. And the language choices are really kind of casual. They're not these presidential things. They're very, we're, we're thinking about you so very much. You know, it's this kind of very um, thing that you would hear from your family, from your favorite uncle would come in and say this kind of thing. So it's very friendly, very casual. Now, paragraph three is just absolutely loaded with these real, with this, look at the syntax, these very, very specific use of words, daring, brave, grace, challenge, special, joy, hunger, explore, discover, serve. Those are all really strong, powerful images that, that give these kinds of connotations of things. They're not just like, well, yeah, they were really nice and they were strong and they were brave, but these, these very specific kinds of things. And again, this connecting with all of us to bring in this idea that we are 
we're all in this together, that we share this together as a country. This is very soothing, this is very comforting. And to give the idea that these were not just astronauts, these guys who were up there on some stage doing their job, they were servants, that they were working for us, that the government paid them and trained them, and that they were our servants, so it's our loss. So again, he's establishing these connections, he's using this ethos to build up this effectiveness so that everyone listening to the speech would be touched by it and would feel this as well and feel connected to it. Now in paragraph 4 he does something interesting. He sort of laid the seeds for this, but he starts making these connections between the past and the future. So not just that we've had this terrible tragedy and life is awful right now, but that we were taken by surprise that really we live in a world where all this great stuff happens and reminds us that we've had 25 years of being successful of that. And then this particular phrase, we've only just begun. Now this is a time when you know something terrible has happened. He's not talking about shutting down the program. He's not talking about maybe we shouldn't be going in space. Maybe this is too dangerous. Maybe it's too expensive. Maybe we don't know what we're doing. Instead, it implies this future. We've only just begun. Is this idea that we're moving forward? That this is not an ending, even though we've had this terrible tragedy. And again, this use of pioneers. It's the second time in the speech he's used this word. And that word pioneer calls up these images of America's past. So you have this idea between the past and the success of 25 years, but moving into the future. Um, pioneers were from uh, the founding of our country. They were the ones who went out on the new frontiers, who were out by themselves out there in these dangerous lands, breaking ground, breaking ground and breaking trail for the rest of us, which is exactly what we were seeing these astronauts doing. Now in paragraph 5, we get to the O in soaps and the A in soaps, where he starts to realize that on this occasion, he's not just talking to the grown-ups around the TV, but this was, again, when this um, it was the first teacher in space, so there were all of these schools and school children who watched this disaster live on TV. These kids who probably would never have seen this, wouldn't be watching the news at 6 o'clock, but because of this particular um, teacher that was going into space for the first time, all of these classrooms were connected and watching these people blow up live on television. So he goes to address the school children in particular and calls them out. Notice this very simple language, this very direct address, very comforting. He, he uses this phrase, it's all part of the process. This idea that this wasn't this awful thing so much that happened, but, but that this is a natural thing that happens. It's very soothing and comforting. You know, that whole circle of life, Lion King kind of idea that, yeah, bad things happen, but that's the way life is. You kind of move forward. Again, he uses these emotion-laden words like brave and future. And connecting to last paragraph's idea about we've only just begun, talks about these challenger crew who was pulling us into the future. And again, using the we and not the presidential I to create the sense that this is a nation that's sharing in the journey. Now, paragraph six is a little bit different. There's a distinct change in tone, and this would help if you understand a little bit again about the rhetorical situation, because in 1986, when this happened, we were still in the middle of the Cold War here, and we knew that the world was watching, and particularly was watching, there was a segment of the world that was not all that sad to see an American failure. So when he speaks in here about having um, this idea that we do not hide our space program, we don't keep secrets and cover things up, implies that somebody else does, and that's you right over here, USSR is taking a dig in this, and saying that even though we've had a failure, we still have this American pride because of this emotionally laden word, freedom, that we are different. So it sets up even in the midst of this thing that could be a, a, seen as a real tragedy of our technology, that it really failed and we had these people killed and this, this, all this stuff lost. Um, in the middle of this, it says, but this is something to take pride in, that we don't hide from this. We show the world what we did. We don't keep secrets. We are a free country. We admit our mistakes. And because of that, we move forward. So he's building up this idea of American pride and kind of taking a little dig at the Soviet Union in the middle of this, um, this otherwise emotional speech. Here we get this little bit of political play going on.
Paragraph six continues with these ideas of phrases that connect the past to the future. We'll continue our quest, and quest again implies the Knights of the Round Table, this noble cause, right? King Arthur would go on a quest, uh, that there'll be more things happening. And again, looking at the future, and then look at this idea of everyday citizens. It's not that we're going to have astronauts and military people, but we're going to have crews, volunteers, civilians, teachers. These are the people you know, the people next door, evoking this kind of everyday citizen. And once again, we see through the whole thing, we're getting this first person plural in everything. It's our hopes and our journeys, not their hopes and their journeys, but all of us together to build this kind of uh, sense that we are a community even through this tragedy. Now, paragraph six is also understandable a little bit towards the end. If you understand that even by this point in the day, uh, the tragedy had occurred very early that morning and this speech was obviously given that night. There were a lot of people who were calling out already and trying to place the blame and say, whose fault was this? What was this caused by? And a lot of people were saying, you know, maybe this is just it for NASA. We spend all this money on space. What do we get for it? I mean, is any real money to be made by sending people out into, out into the atmosphere there? And so you see Reagan here in this point trying to start to build these connections again, that's using that ethos again, but also puts in a little bit of separation by kind of making it clear that NASA is the people who are responsible. He says, every man or woman who works at NASA and worked on this mission and tells us there and says, okay, I know you guys are the ones who did this. Um, and it's kind of also answering the critics who were calling for the space program to be cut already and sort of reassuring all of these people that they're not going to lose their jobs and their futures. We know of your anguish. We know that you're upset right now. We share it again, that we and that sharing, all these ideas of things that are going to bring people together. But he's also, you know, making it kind of clear that who it is that he's speaking to at this particular point in the speech. Paragraph 7 goes into this historical reference, and again, notice this theme of connecting things from the past to the future. So we're not going to be stuck here. We rest on all of the, all of the great triumphs and, and things that we've learned from the past, but the whole trajectory is to move forward into the, into the future here with these ideas. And he creates this metaphor by referring back to Francis Drake, where just like the sailors of the old days would sail on the sea, now we have the astronauts in space. So you have this metaphor that's set up. And again, these really, really strong emotional laden words, explorer, frontier, dedication, complete. Uh, these are really strong words that evoke all of these kinds of images in our mind um, of all of these kinds of brave and daring people from our country. And this idea about what we say about Challenger, their dedication was like Drake's complete. He's bringing closure to this idea and meaning to the lives. The lives were not wasted. This was a completion of their mission. It's a sad completion, but they've done their job and they can now rest. This is, this is a, a coming full circle kind of thing, like he was kind of trying to tell the children way back in a couple earlier paragraphs. Now the final paragraph closes with this really strong imagery. This is a literary allusion to a poem, and I'll, and I'll include the poem in the other handout for you. And actually starts to bring in some of the religious imagery to, to, again, bring comfort to people at this point. The use of we maintains this ethos and connections that he's been establishing throughout the whole speech. And then closes with this idea of, of um, honoring people, the crew honored us with the way that the manner in which they lived their lives and brings in this idea of these everyday images, you know, you wave goodbye to people in the morning, see you later, you get in the car, you drive off, but that everyday sort of waving sort of touch is contrasted with the next touch, which is to touch the face of God. So connecting that everyday um, kind of corporal thing that happens to this idea of the the ending of life and this idea of what you're going through into eternity and into an unknown future, but the idea that they've landed into a comforting place from this bit and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. So these are just some of the ways that you can start to dissect and really look at the rhetorical devices that are used in this particular speech. So keep this in mind in this kind of really close reading as we look at all of the texts and things that we're going to be studying this year. And that's it.